<laughs> Hi, Ken. Welcome to Side B Stories. It's so great to have you with me today. Thank you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. I often describe myself as a writer, speaker, and teacher, and, um, and a mentor. <clears throat> in, the, in a broader way, though, um, I'm an, a bit of an odd duck insofar as I um, love to process things with people. So I use beauty, and I use goodness, and I use truth. Um, and I seek to uh, uh, winsomely draw people through narrative and through story. Can you give me an idea as also for, for the listener to understand your academic background? Well, I um, went to, um, as an un- undergraduate, I went to Case Institute of Technology in Cleveland, Ohio. So, I'm, and I'm a bit, another thing about me, I'm a, I'm a philosopher of science. I was drawn to astronomy and math and physics and so forth. Um, but then I, uh, I went off to, started at uh, graduate school uh, school at, at uh, Berkeley in California, but then um, I, the oddest, craziest thing, many things happened that led me instead to go to Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, this is a long time ago. Um, and I got a Master of Theology there and then working with different organizations, but I eventually uh, started teaching at the King's College in Briarcliff Manor, New York, when it was used to be up there. And um, I worked at New, I, I was going to NYU to work on the philosophy of religion. So I completed my PhD uh, from that. And then some years later, about 10 years after that, I wanted to go to England and just take a sabbatical. So um, what ended up as a sabbatical turned out to be actually um, going to Oriel College at Oxford. And, and ultimately, I got my DPhil in, in philosophy and, and uh, theology. Okay. So can you obviously have studied at the highest levels at Oxford, areas of philosophy and theology, but you didn't start there. And so I'd like to go back to the beginning of your story and seeing how those atheistic views developed. Why don't you you start us back into your childhood, your your family of origin, give us a sense of the home in which you were raised, whether or not God or religion was part of your family life, a part of your culture life. Why don't you start us there? Yeah. Um, I, as I look back, I, I re- recently realized, I didn't know this until uh, recent uh, inquiries, that I was actually baptized um, in the Episcopal Church when I was four years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father was a bus driver and in New Jersey. And um, he was a very, very witty and clever man, and people loved him. And uh, he apparently had one of his pa- one of his passengers. Um, he must have gotten close to him and had an impact on him. And so my father started going to that Episcopal church. And so my godfather was this man, and so this other fellow. Uh, but when he died of a brain tumor, not long after that, my father lost his best friend and his, mm-hmm. his whole role then with regard to God was one of bitterness. How could a God allow that to happen? And so that was his narrative. The, the net effect was that um, I still remember vaguely um, going to that Episcopal church. I was about four or five, uh, but then I remember what it looked like. It was a strange experience. And then I also remember my parents sending my older sister uh, and me to church. It was a Baptist church that we had to walk by ourselves. This is in the, you know, in the fifties. And so this is what these things were done then, but we walked by ourselves almost two miles to this Baptist church and we had to go to a Sunday school class and then we'd come back together. But my parents never went to church at all uh, at that time. But it was a strange thing hearing uh, those. I still remember the lessons, the flannel board is uh, teachings. I still remember the, the songs we sang. So it obviously had a big mark on me in some ways. And then also my grandmother um, had a huge impact and she was definitely a strong believer. So there were, there were those influences mm-hmm. there and my uncle, uh, one of my uncles as well. So there was there, but it was not something that was fed in my church. Uh, mm-hmm. in my home. Mm-hmm. So as a child, you had some, would you say you had some kind of childhood belief in God, that God was real, yes, I, that God was there? Yeah, I did. Um, and um, we, we talked about these things, but uh, my sister and I were in the world of fantasy and imagination a lot. And um, we got this set of book trails. It was an eight volume collection of stories. And I used to read them out loud to her. 
and uh, it was a magical thing. So we were very much in the mind of the imagination. But in that in that understanding, we were believers in that God existed and so forth. That's an interesting thought, though I didn't carry it to its logical conclusion. Though I remember having some experiment with prayer when I was about seven, I think, when I asked God to send me a million dollars, and I really was all. <laughs> And believed, I had heard that if you believe, with, if you have enough faith to believe it, you can. So imagine my disappointment the next morning. So that kind of changed my, <laughs> when the obvious would have occurred. But um, I, I, I knew I believed in God, although I had strange dreams. I still remember at the age of six having a dream about infinity. The number one got oppressively large and larger and larger until I woke up in terror. So this mm. idea of the ineffable, of the mysterious, this has been a motif in my journey from that from that inception. And I was drawn and terrified, both mm-hmm. in that dream and also in this uh, my experience with the with the mysteries of nature. It seems to be a motif in my life. Yeah, but I so I believed in God in that sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But your father, in some sense, had had rejected, and both of your parents, neither one of them went to church, and so you no. and your sister walked to church and and you were developing uh, a child well, a childhood belief but also an appreciation for the grandeur and mystery of of the transcendent and so how long did that continue until you started becoming skeptical of of what you were seeing or believing we went from Dumont New Jersey and later on we went uh, as a period of we went to to the Louisiana my mother's from there so I lived in two worlds the the um Monroe, Louisiana, which was actually going back like 30 years in the past. And, and we would go to a church there. My grandmother would, we, would take us to a, a church and so forth. But um, it, when we came back to New Jersey, we start, my parents again sent my sister and I to church. So we went to this Emerson Union Church. But later, a new pastor came. It was Emerson Bible Church. And the pastor was a graduate from Dallas Theological Seminary. I was fascinated by him, and he had a good mind. Mm. And uh, and I got I, what happened was I had two sets of friends. By the time I went to high school, I went to Hackensack High, big school, <clears throat> and my friends there were not believers. My deep, my closest friends, but my friends at at uh, at uh, Emerson Bible Church were. And I was involved in even Christian Service Brigade, which was this uh, uh, Christian version of scouting, boy scouting. And my friends would, uh, they'd have stories. They'd, they would have, have a story in games and so forth. And sometimes then they were going into this back room and they'd come out and say they received Jesus. And so I was the last one left. So I figured I'd better do it too. So I went in there to, and I heard a guy say a prayer. I listened to the prayer and said, yes, but it was his prayer. It's not really my own invitation, but more an intellectual reception rather than a personal embrace. Mm. And that was a real problem for me because I thought I had the real thing, but it wasn't real. And that and real profound inner tension that produced. It wasn't real because obviously it was another person's prayer. You accepted it intellectually, but not personally. That's correct. So for those who don't really understand the difference there. Um, they might think just you're a Christian just because you believe certain tenets. Yeah, and it's a matter of not believing about but trusting in. Mm. And that's, uh, this whole idea of a transfer of trust, a choice, a will, is not rather than just an intellectual acknowledgement of a thing, became a very, very different uh, thing indeed. You know, it's, it's more a matter of a choice that you're making, not just an intellectual acknowledgement. There's a big difference. Right, and so you never made that personal f- faith um, decision trust in what that yes. which you believed although i wrote in a bible the next year i received uh, when i was i think 14 uh, to, i received jesus as my personal savior so you so i i knew the words but i didn't have the reality and that but i could not in my heart of hearts acknowledge that because then i'd say man it's none of this is true then so it was a, in the interior tension terrified me, mm. and sometimes his sermons would terrify me because I would then I'd have to work up some experience, emotional experience, to, to believe I was still there. Um, it was a strange experience for me to be in that. So I was two different people. 
So with your, your more secularized friends, you were yeah. thinking more maybe scientifically, more uh, in, a, in a way that uh, towards the natural world as ultimate reality? Well, in part, yeah, they were more into, into, into music and also into uh, history. They were secularized. You see, they, were, they loved great music and art and so forth. And it was a different kind of music, a different kind of an art, a different kind of an ethos than I saw at, at Emerson Bible Church, which was very thin. And so I, 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 I was drawn more to the, the life of, of, of the mind and of, of the aesthetic dimension, the beauty again. But um, the, so I had I became two different kinds of people. I was terrified, though, that two of them would ever meet each other. I wouldn't know how to respond. I'd be two different people. So there was this dichotomy for a while, a cognitive dissonance uh, 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 for a while. And so did one end up kind of winning over the other in terms of... Well, here's of... what happened. Yeah. One, you, can't, you can't live that way. Right. And I, when I... So I... in in um, it was in the um, fall. So I'm an old guy. It was in it was in the fall of '63 then when I um, that I went to Case Institute of Technology, and I remember being in the dorm, and I would still read my Bible as a kind of a perfunctory thing before I'd go to sleep. And I decided I was going to go to a church. It was an embarrassing experience for me. Mm. It was some kind of fundamentalist kind of experience, and I was burned by that. And so I then I formally took my Bible. And I remember this moment. It was an amazing thing, I did, that, that I took it and put it in the shelf. I can see myself doing it. It's an iconic moment. You know, those, sometimes time is frozen on, on a particular Im image, and you visually you take a photo. I put it in the shelf, and it was symbolic of the fact that I won't deal with this anymore. I'm, I'm going to move on, and I'm not going to. I'm going to bracket God's existence or non-existence, neither accepting nor rejecting, because I didn't want to in, deal with that internal tension that was too great. So I just decided. So it was more of a sex, scientific humanist was was my modality. Okay, okay. So you you put God on the shelf, literally and spiritually <laughs> and figuratively, in yeah, all, all of this. All respects, yeah. Yes. And that's why I say I bracketed God. Yes. By which I mean I didn't want to deal with the questions of who am I, why am I here, where did I come from, where am I going, the fundamental issues of life. Right. Because I knew in my heart of hearts. I didn't have answers. And I still remember and I was at Pi Kappa Alpha in the fraternity. And that, it, my weekend um, blew apart when I was 19, second uh, sophomore. Uh, it, it, all my plans went apart. And I was the only one in the house. And for the first time, all these issues of questions about life imposed themselves. And it was a terrifying thing. I still remember that awful experience. I don't know who I am. I don't know why I'm here. I don't why, know where I came from and where, I, where I'm going. I, I, and so I said, I'm never going to do that again. So like, as Pascal predicted, indifference and distraction became my modality after that. And I never, I made sure I would never let that happen. I didn't want to think about it. Yes. Now you had mentioned that you were drawn to the life of the mind and that evidently wasn't in the, the world of Christianity that you had experienced. So I'm imagining that there weren't any more intellectual Christians in your world to whom you could go and discuss God or Christianity or these larger questions with a Christian for whom you respected or could find, um, I guess, intellectual fodder at the level at which you were processing ideas. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, or? I'd say that would be true. The life of the mind, I found it to be somewhat anemic in, in those contexts of the church experiences I had. Though there were men, and I will say this, godly men and women, especially these men who took me under their wing and became like mentors to me. I still remember them. And they were part of my journey. So it was a very real sense that I, because I, uh, my, my scouting and also in, in my Sunday school classes, these were men that I did admire. They had a quality of, in them, but they were ordinary men. They were not extraordinary in their way of thinking or apprehension. Uh, but I was, but I, so it didn't satisfy the, the, the level of understanding or beauty, because I was drawn mm. to beauty and to, to beautiful things. I, I became a lover of great, of beautiful books, for example, and aesthetic things of that nature. So that's where I found my two best friends were both people who loved beauty and, and, but, and, and weren't, weren't as concerned about truth 
they were more concerned about good beauty and goodness in a certain way. It's an interesting thing. Mm. But there was a sort of mystery that was there. Yeah. Right. And so as you were moving into this more aesthetic, uh, ethereal world uh, yeah. that was secularized, I'm curious because they weren't as concerned about truth, but there has to also be a grounding of goodness and beauty. Was that anything that caused any kind of cognitive tension in terms of the grounding? Or when you're looking at something like you were looking at the sky earlier and you feel this, um, you know, this, this, the power of what you're seeing, um, that it has to come from somewhere or be grounded in something, or was it just, it just was. That is why I didn't want to think about it okay. because I knew it was pointing beyond me beyond to something that it was ineffable. And I was terrified of ineffability because I didn't want to think about those categories because they were, they were, they, they reminded me of the internal turmoil underneath where I knew I was, I was an imposter. I was pretending to be what I was not, but I couldn't admit it to myself. So that was a very real dilemma for me. <laughs> but, but, but you said in, in Pascalian terms, you, you became distracted, right? With, yeah. with things or, or you, and distraction. Indifferent and distracted. Yes. And so the, my way then would be to find, make sure I didn't think hard about those questions anymore. Mm -hmm. But the point is I am, I can't, I cannot help but think about meaning. I'm haunted by it. So uh, that's what's going on. And so um, I think it's, it is the, 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 the hound of heaven and, and God who stoops to conquer. And in my case, he stoops to conquer. And so he used, of all things, then the uh, psychotropic drugs to become, made me to become aware of a realm that I had been trying to occlude so successfully for a good period of time. And it was it was in my junior year at Case Institute of Technology that I began to get involved with uh, hash hashish and with uh, grass and and then later with LSD and so um, that opened up an entirely different world. That was a whole whole new realm. And so that that pursued was that uh, through psychedelics was that pursuit of meaning beyond the imminent world or was it just it was, distraction it was, it was, no it was not that it was it was the pursuit of a kind of new kind of con another um, level a, of consciousness yeah as well as the synesthesia and i have to say it was a pleasurable experience the synesthesia where um you hear uh, you hear color and 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 you see sound and your senses are moved together and everything comes together there are reasons why that occurs but in those those conditions, um, I found it to be very compelling, very drawing, um, and so it forced me in. And so we were doing experiments with with time, even. My I, and I experienced um, a very different experience with with even time. It dilated. We would actually be able to go into a dark room and take take a, a cigarette and 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 write a word, a short word, and it would linger. You could mm. see the thing. So it was a very intriguing experience yes. indeed. So we were doing experiments with that and with uh, different aspects of consciousness. Being, being um, after all, we were scientists. So we uh, tried to uh, control the, the variables and so forth. And we believed in Timothy Leary's idea. So it was experimentation. And that's what it was in, in, in consciousness. So, you know, sometimes in those experimentations or in psychedelics or people will get a sense of the other, you know, like more yes, than yes. the natural world, that there yeah. is definitely something more than yeah. just what, you know, our senses, um, yeah. that there's there's something more. Yeah. I mean, did it make you question again um, the the possibility of God if, if you know, based upon your experiences? Not so much that. It, it made me aware of the mysteries that surrounded me, but I still didn't connect them to transcendence. But here's what happened on one particular occasion. For the very first time, I went away from other people on a, on a trip. And I remember going away from the other guys, 
and I'm working. It, it was a journey. It took me a world to get up to the top of those steps. As my hand is going into the wall, and yet it's not, and so forth. And I finally see myself in the mirror, and, and it was an incredible flash of, of of complex geometries and so forth. But then I found myself, for some reason, meandering to the end of the hall, which I never would do. I went to my friend Ray Musselman's bedroom, and I found myself on in, in laying on his bed, and suddenly it happened. Ah. I was aware of the of the presence of the holy, and I was terrified and absolutely drawn to him. It was both the mysterium it happened again, but more now fully. It was so intense. I don't know how long it must have been. It must have been about maybe fifteen minutes it lasted because it was long enough for Ray to come upstairs after a while and wonder where I was. Right. But I, I was pinned on that bed in an ineffable terror and longing. And I realized that there was a separation from that which, but I still, but I wanted it more than anything else, this, this, this being. And so my friend, my friend Ray comes to the, it says, where have you been? It's, it's just, I'm talking with God, man. <laughs> That's that was my answer. <laughs> so that and every time subsequent, every time I dropped acid after that, whether I was with people or not, the most important part was to be to to, to deal with um, the, the the ineffable, the mysterious, the, the mysterium tremendum. Now I'm I'm just thinking of the the listeners here that they would say, well, you just were hallucinating. You were on mm -hmm. acid. How I mean, so, so it would seem. Mm -hmm. One Nothing one would. One would imagine. Uh, yes. Yeah. How can you differentiate between that which was a hallucination and that was the real? Mm -hmm. What happened is um, I had to go back to Cleveland to, to, um, to do one thing. It was right after graduation. Uh, or right after, so I went back to Cleveland and saw my friends. And there were about eight, eight of us who dropped acid together in that same place. And one of them I didn't like. So I was just going to avoid him. Of, well, of course, you can guess what happened. As we get further and farther, I get drawn to him. And I realized why I didn't like him, because he was a mirror image of myself. Because at the age of 13, he too had gone into, um, had, had the same experience. We had a profession of faith in Jesus, but it wasn't, he realized it wasn't real. And I, when I forced me after eight years had to have to admit that I didn't either. So for the first time, we both became aware by through each other why we didn't like each other, because we were reminiscent of the same process and the same problem. We both found ourselves suddenly on the road less traveled. Mm -hmm. We were heading toward the road. We were on a road, and we could see that road. We, were, we couldn't put on the brakes. We couldn't stop. A forced choice was made. We both took the road less traveled at the same moment in time, and we were then instantly as straight as we are now in this room. All, all the hallucinations were gone, and it was replaced by the power of the script, the Spirit who brought to mind the scriptures we'd learned as kids, because we'd learned the same texts of scriptures. I'd share a verse, and he'd now, as a new believer, having found Christ, would understand its meaning for the first time, and he was blown away. Then he'd share one with me, and, and it was back and forth, back and forth, until the joy became so intense, we literally couldn't stand it. We had to back off. And when we backed off, the trip came back. Mm. And then we'd get back into the scriptures, and then it would be all focused on that again, all night long. And the first, and I went to church for the first time the next morning. That was a Saturday night. And I was, I remember going there late for the service, it turned out. I don't even know how I got there. I was in the balcony. And I just remember the end of the, the sermon started, and it was on the prodigal son. So it was a lovely uh, theme uh, for me. And, but the, was that night on that experience, I knew I was going to go to Dallas Seminary, not because of an inference, but because of a, an assurance. This book is God's blueprint for living. That's what, that was the metaphor. This is his blueprint. I got to learn what it says, not to be prepared for ministry, just to get my head screwed screw on right. So I made it. I came back and I made an application. Though I had applied to Berkeley and Columbia and had been admitted both places, I also put in my application to Dallas Seminary. But it was a profound experience that. Uh, and then I, 
and we, with a witness who had the same experience as well. And I've talked with him recently about that. Right. I've never heard anything like it. No. So it's, it's, it's almost as if you had had some kind of intellectual ascent younger, earlier in your life, but there yes. was no, there was no palpable reality of God, whether it be personal Precisely. or otherwise. And then later uh, you have this extraordinary experience of God the pal- where you could not deny the palpable reality of God. So, so it was where truth and reality came together for you. And I presume all of the dissonance you had felt prior somehow coalesced into a wholeness yes. of, of uh, all of those big questions of life that you were yes. talking about, identity and yes. meaning and all of those things, were they met with some kind of a, almost a sudden satisfaction through the person of God? You knew who you were, you knew where you were going, you, you, you completely immediately changed your path. Yes. Um, I was a new creation, but it launched a journey, an agonizing journey of work, conscious worldview transition that lasted about a year. I'm I'm sorry to say this, but I'm not recommending this. You right. need to understand this. Uh, it is not a recommendation. It is just a real realization. That's why I almost never tell this story, because people get the wrong idea. I'm saying God stooped to conquer, and that is an important word for people to hear. This is what I'm reporting. What happened? Right. It was radical. So it was a year I was there. And it was in the fall of, the, of that year, the next year, it was, it was, I'd been there a year. It all came together. I had, I had an epiphanic experience that was not just in the mind, but in, it shivered my, in my being, my, my body, my, my mind, everything. Everything in this epiphany of sudden recognition after about a year um, of being there, it all came together. Suddenly, I had a worldview that was coherent consistent, clear, and comprehension, comprehension. Mm-hmm. It all fit together. I had been reading Schaefer's, uh, his book, his first book came out, Escape from Reason in 68. And I, and I found out about this guy I'd never heard about C.S. Lewis. So I was reading Lewis and, and, and Schaefer and so forth. And then the, 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 you know, the guy who was there and so forth. But it was that, it took that long. It was an agonizing process before, until all came together in a coherent whole. And it was the most satisfying. It was visceral, not just cognitive. And I was immersed in the beauty of, of um, just the, the splendor of mystery. And the, the, it, was, it was ethereal. It was um, luminous. It was, it was, um, I was in this thin place between heaven and earth, where, where, where it was a numinous encounter with the living God. So it was grace to have those that, that and, and I've been grace to have other experiences of this nature that have been very powerful for me. So when, when everything coalesced for you in terms of the, the Christian or the God-centered worldview, and everything made sense, and it was comprehensive and cohesive, and yeah. it corresponded with reality. You were all these other things, the the mysticism in terms of Eastern mysticism, your mm-hmm. occultism, your use of psychedelics. Those, I would presume, as your Christian worldview got stronger, those things you were able to see that those were not based in truth, or or were you were willing to give those up. As your yes. as your understanding of the true reality solidified, um, that those kind of went away as not yes. part yes. of the true truth. Or yes. it sounds like you're you you God was taken off the shelf for you uh-huh. in a very very powerful way, yeah. and has informed all that you've done since, both you and your wife and your life. So that's why I love the life of the mind and the heart. And so, so it's the, the I, I love the interior of the beauty and the goodness and the truth. And I love the heart, the head and the hands. And so mm-hmm. being, knowing and doing, loving well, learning well, living well. And so it all, all truth connects together. So as a synthesizer, I see them all together and I love to connect things with things in disparate ways. Mm-hmm. And uh, to, so 
because it, when when I whether it's it's music or literature or, or, or film or poetry or architecture or whatever it is, beauty always points to the ineffable uh, one who made it all. So mm -hmm. everything connects, everything relates in that way. It's a it's a lovely way of being. You know? Yes, and I I would imagine too as as compared to the lack of finding those in the community of Christianity who did not have a fostered uh, life of the mind, it, it seems as if you've been a leader in that field now and have probably found strong community uh, with those who call themselves Christians but have a very strong life of the mind. The love of the mind, but the love of the heart too, so that the uh, mm -hmm. intense, the, the love of the heart, the love of beauty. So love mm. of natural beauty right. and uh, aesthetic beauty and um, and all these other components. Now, all that I'd ever learned about music and art and lit all converged in this mm. one. And so I see myself then as one where all these fields kind of point in, 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 in integrated ways. And I love to connect disparate things and put them together. So I say that the heart cannot rejoice in what the mind rejects. Now, there are... I would imagine some curious skeptics listening today who really respect who you are in terms of your ability to see and to experience things in very deep and grand ways. And, and, uh, and I wonder if they're, they're curious, you know, that you have also obviously found a worldview that makes sense of who you are and what you see and what you experience in reality in the world. Um, and, you, and it makes sense for you. What, how could you um, advise or encourage someone who is curious and skept but yet skeptical as you once were to continue to seek to find as you did? Yeah, yeah because I think that is the issue you just said. Um, those who seek will find. Those who ask, it will be given to them. Those who knock, it will be open to them. There, there are two kinds of people in the world, those who seek to know, know God and those who seek to, to avoid him, and both will succeed in the end. So this this whole idea then is what do I seek? Do I seek uh, is is my aspiration big enough? Because I claim that we are we're, that no earthbound felicity can sustain the awful awful freight of human aspiration because we are bearers of the imago dei, and therefore uh, to avoid God is to actually deny ourselves, mm. and so to pursue Him is actually to discover ourselves by losing ourselves and finding Him. And frankly, everyone admits that personhood is better than the impersonal in their practice. Everybody admits that. They just don't want it to be true of the universe. And the reason for that is because personhood is daunting. The creator of beauty displays the ugly. The source of goodness reveals evil. And the author of truth exposes error. For those who are seeking it, it as you kind of experienced or spoke of, there you use the word terrifying a few times that there, yeah, it, yeah. it does seem a little bit frightening, a little bit terrifying to pursue mm -hmm. the one who, you know, is all and is in all and above all and through all well, and over all, but, but it's worth it, you know, it is um, worth it. and for the Christians who are listening, who want to help lead or uh, foster uh, skeptics towards looking and seeking towards God, um, how would you best advise Christians to to engage with those who are skeptical? I think they're asking this fundamental questions, and it's three of Jesus' questions. It's, it's it, the, these three questions. Um, if you don't mind, I'll show them to you. Uh, what do you seek? Who do you say I am? And do you love me more than these? So, what do you seek is for me the most fundamental question that determines what you find. What are you looking for? You see. And is anything, is it, is it big enough to sustain you? So and I, and I think an, a, a prayer, even the desire to be pleasing to him is pleasing to him. And so I think an offering would be to say, Lord, I'm, I, would, I'm, I don't know if I believe in you, but I would be, I want to, to discover if you are who you claim to be and, and, and just uh, give me the grace of, of knowing you if, if, as I pursue this. So as you study scripture or um, expose yourself to something, that you're just inviting the, the grace of, of holy desire. And then, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, who do you say that I am? And yeah, uh, yes. and who, yeah so you've got to, everyone, here's the thing about this. We're, this isn't an optional thing. Everybody, if Jesus is right, and this is the Pascalian wager, of course, that uh, the one who who doesn't believe in God gets nothing of, of gain, after, but the one who does gets everything, the other one. But if he's right, Jesus is going to be the judge as well as the lover of our soul. So he comes in his first advent in humility, but ultimately we will all have to give an answer to who do you say that I am? And every, every tongue will acknowledge, would be my, mighty smart to be willing to acknowledge him in the now and bow the, na- the, the knee now, mm. because ultimately we will. <laughs> so it'd be, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the grace of the, uh, you can't be on a road without making a decision. And so you need to make an informed, and this is my word, I appeal to people's pride. And I mean by that, that you owe it to yourself if this person has shaped the world in so many profound ways as he has, ancient, medieval, and modern. You owe it to yourself to at least hear what he had to say of himself before you decide to believe or, or accept or reject. But you will either accept or reject. You, you don't have another, you don't have an option. You have it, you, you will. So wouldn't it be wise for you to choose whether to have an informed opinion as to whether accept him or reject him? That's why we created this little thing, Jesus in his own words, which is that's exactly what it does is it gives them uh, the way of actually having to uh, under, uh, understand that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some- what, yes. What, what you're saying too, just reminds me a little bit of it, in your story where you were talking about that there, there has to be a choice at some point in the road. That's and, right. It uh, was the two roads diverge and one, right. and, and I will not, I can say it now that's been 50, how long has that been? 55 years, is it? I mean, it's scary to think, you know, because um, how brief the earthbound sojourn is. But if we're not, if we should always be amazed at the brevity. We're in our last days, never presume a year. So wouldn't we be wise then to see there was defining moments in the journey of our lives. But if, if you can't avoid a choice of, of Jesus permanently, if, if you can only say no so many times. And this, I, got, I don't, I don't know, for example, when we were in that experience and we, we didn't, it, what if we hadn't chosen the road less travel? Would that have been our last opportunity? I don't know that, but there is a last, there's, a, there's one step too far and a person can make, say no only, and then garden will, then their heart will be hardened. Mm-hmm. So there's a, there's an, there's, it, this is not just a game we're playing. This is a reality that you have to engage in. And if you could, at least if you make an informed decision about whether Jesus is who he claimed to be or not. Or not. But you will have to accept him or reject him. Mm. Yeah, your story, Ken, has given us so much to think about today. Uh, so many big issues of ineffability and ineffability and beauty and goodness and truth and just experience and the reality of God. We are seeking who we are seeking and who are we? I think everyone who will be listening to your story will be asking themselves the same questions that you were asking yourself. And I appreciate you bringing these these big and grandiose yet very, very personal issues to bear to all of us. Thank you. Um, so I really appreciate your story, Ken. I, I know that it's going to touch some lives out there that of those who are God willing seeking and that they will find. So thank you, thank thank you so much for coming on with me today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Appreciate it.